I want to talk about what creativity and imagination are, why they are both critical for all of us, especially today, and what are over 10 ways that we can go about bringing more creativity and imagination into our daily lives. So creativity is defined as the ability to create original ideas that have value, and imagination is the ability to create things in our mind that do not exist in front of us. These two work hand in hand and they are valuable constantly throughout our lives. So for instance, if you want to improve, you want to change any part of your life, you have to be able first to imagine what your life would be like if it were different than it is now, and then creatively problem solve ways you can go about bringing that change into being. And this is useful in our personal lives and in our work and professional lives as well. In fact, creative problem solving is a hugely valuable tool that many employers say they're looking for and have a hard time finding in candidates. And Einstein is quoted as saying that logic will take you from A to B and imagination will take you everywhere. So there are many different types of intelligence and means of measuring intelligence, but one of them is what's called divergent thinking. So divergent thinking is the ability to look at a situation or a problem and imagine many different options and solutions for it. This is the opposite of linear thought, which is having a problem and seeing one clear solution. A classic way to measure divergent thinking would be to say, um, how many uses can you come up with for this pen? And depending how many you come up with in a certain amount of time, you would have more or less divergent thinking ability. And today in our school system, especially here in the US, there's a tremendous emphasis on linear thinking as opposed to divergent thinking. And this is for a variety of factors, but mainly I think it comes about from the need to measure students learning, right? So in order to know whether or not a student got the concept, they fill out a piece of homework, have certain answers on it, and you mark yes or no whether they got the answer that you're looking for. So there's already a prescribed answer that is correct, and everything else is incorrect. And this is how most of, most of our education and our schooling is done today. Arguably, this stems all the way back to the Industrial Revolution, when schools were redesigned like factories. So it was at that point that we started grouping kids by age. So you had a batch of students who would go through school. They changed classes on the bell, as if in a factory, and they were looking for measurable results. Did the student learn? Let me check my book and like see how many answers they got correct. Then we know whether or not they learned, which is actually, if you think about it, a very foreign way of learning when compared to the way we naturally learn as children, where we're exploring our environment and effortlessly taking in information. And to be clear, there are many great educators and teachers who see this problem, see the emphasis on linear thought and find very creative ways of working around it. But the system itself is not generally designed to encourage divergent thinking. They actually did a study on a group of kindergartners and found that most of them, 98% of these kindergartners, scored in the genius level for divergent thinking. They could come up with so many different uses for that pen, right? And then as they got older and progressed through school, their divergent thinking abilities went down. So this was a very interesting study because it shows that we all have this capability, absolutely, and most of us lose it, or at least it greatly decreases as we get older. There is a YouTube video I want to include a link for here called Changing Education Paradigms. Completely changed the way I think about education in our country today. Very fascinating if you're interested in that. Otherwise, let's get back to this topic of creativity. And now that we've talked a little bit about why it's so important, especially in the US today, because most of us simply are underexposed to opportunities to really engage in that, what are some things we can do ourselves to be a little bit more creative and develop that? And I wanna start with three overarching principles that apply to any of these techniques. And all of them can be learned from children because little kids are masters of creative play. And I think that's for many reasons, but I wanna get into three specifically. The first is children are curious naturally, and it makes sense because they don't know how the world works yet. Everything is literally new to them, and they're very used to asking questions, being told that 
what they're doing is incorrect. So they're very curious. I think as adults, we lose a lot of our curiosity because we get the sense that we kind of know how things work. We have a pretty good sense of what the rules are. And also being curious is admitting that you don't know something. So as soon as you're asking questions, you're admitting you don't know the answers. And that's a little harder for adults to do than children much of the time. So the first thing to keep in mind is to just try and develop a greater sense of curiosity. Explore areas that you don't know. What's something that will make you feel like the world is new and big and like you're unfamiliar with it? Then the second principle is that children are fantastic at playing. Their work is play, right? That's what kids do. They play all day. And it's important too. I don't think we always think about this. They're learning tremendous amounts as they play. I think it's the way we're actually meant most naturally to learn is to to play, to, in, to be engaged in a creative, imaginative way that pushes our limits a little bit, forces us just a little bit outside of our comfort zone, but it's very effortless and enjoyable. Um, most of us lose sort of this ability or this interest in play as we get older. And actually, I think for most adults, it's something we kind of crave. And I mean play as kind of active, engaging sort of recreation. We have leisure, we have things we do to relax, but they can tend to be very passive, right? Scrolling through our phones isn't really activating anything in our minds. Watching Netflix isn't necessarily doing that either. So most of us relax, but we don't play. We don't really actively recreate in a way that encourages growth and learning and creativity. And that is something we can absolutely take from children. And the third element ties into these other two as well in that children are not big on self-criticism. In fact, little kids don't even know how to criticize their own actions and they're not afraid of judgment or correction from others either. And this gives them a lot of freedom. Talk about coming up with ridiculous creative ideas. Most of us would never say the things children say because we don't want to sound foolish. They don't care. They have no concept of sounding foolish or not. Everything they say already is foolish and they're very free in that. And that helps them a great deal in their playing too. They can play with great freedom because they're not afraid of looking foolish. And that's really hard for us as adults. And for, in some ways, for good reason, we learn how to be aware of our own actions and how we're impacting others. And that's a critical skill. We need to be able to do that. There's a reason that children learn to do that. It's so we can function in society. But most of us hold on to so much of the fear that comes with that knowledge that then we, we restrain ourselves and we hold ourselves back and we don't allow ourselves to like think creative new thoughts or to play and do something kind of like foolish and fun because it's like liberating and good for us. So these are the three principles, right? To stay curious, to find time and a willingness to play and really recreate in an active, engaged manner, and to let go of some of the self-criticism that most of us jump to very immediately. Okay, so with those said, now to my list of, in fact, 12, 12 things that we can do in our daily lives to be more creative. Thing number one, doodle. This is a classic. So many highly intelligent people have doodles all over their notebooks, right? And it's a really nice one because it sets itself up for places where we have to sit and be quiet, right? So in an office, in a classroom, if you're sitting in a meeting, you can be taking notes and doodling. And it's great because it's a little bit of a more passive activity. We can be very focused on something else and be doodling. So you're letting that right side of the brain just kind of click into gear and play around even as you're doing some other work. So that's a great one. Number two, daydream. And this one is interesting. It's another thing that we see kids do a lot because they have free time and sometimes they will just sort of sit or wander around and they won't be thinking about anything in particular. They're letting their mind wander. And now an important thing here is that all of creativity is always a little bit active. So daydreaming is completely different than passive, absolutely passive like zoning out, it's not the same as sleeping, obviously, and it's not the same as scrolling through your phone. We're giving our mind room to play a little bit. And you can see this naturally in that so many people come up with really great ideas in the shower, right? But we're relaxed. We're doing like a little bit of activity, but it's not strenuous. It doesn't take a lot of brain power. And most of us let our minds kind of wander. 
and it can give your brain the chance to unlock some things. There's a useful side note here though, in that productive or useful daydreaming is different than complaining. Anytime we start dwelling on a list of negative things that bother us, that is honestly, it's decreasing creativity because creativity is looking for options. It's exploring open doors. Complaining is the opposite. It's, it's listing out closed doors and things that are keeping us back. So that will never, <laughs> that will never increase creativity. It kind of cramps it. So we need to make sure if we're, if we're daydreaming and we're giving our minds time to wander, that it's in like a free kind of active, but generally positive tone. We don't want to sink down into negative thoughts, but daydreaming can be a great one too. If we're washing the dishes or gardening or doing some simple task that doesn't involve a whole lot of brain power. Number three, make anything. And by that, I mean anything you can do with your hands or your body that will leave the world in a slightly different place than it was when you started. And the outcome needs to not be 100% predictable. So for instance, what we commonly think of when we talk about making something, especially creatively, is painting, drawing, sculpting, and all of those absolutely count. But you could garden, you could work in a wood shop, you could cook something, you could bake a cake, you could rearrange the furniture in your living room. The key is that the outcome can't be known ahead of time, right? If you make the same turkey sandwich every day for lunch, making it again doesn't count as a creative activity in particular because you could do it on autopilot. It has to be something a little bit new. You're not quite sure what's going to happen, but you're exploring and you're making something. Number four, write anything. And this one's great. Writing wordplay is genius for the brain, right? So we can write a story, write an essay, write a blog post. You could journal, you could do some stream of consciousness writing, just let words come up without judging them, let them all fall out on the page really quick. That's a really good exercise too. Or write some poetry, anything you feel inspired by, write anything. Number five, read anything. Uh, within reason, the phone book will only take you so far, but you can get something out of it. But yes, most books, anytime reading is really great for our, for our minds in so many ways. And I especially wanna emphasize fiction here because it requires that you imagine places and scenarios and an entire world that isn't before your face. So it's really working your imagination anytime we read fiction. The other benefit there is usually if we're reading fiction, it's something we're reading for fun. And many of us don't give ourselves time to read for fun. And it's so good. It goes back to this idea of play that we see in children. So you will be learning effortlessly because it doesn't feel like work. That said, if you love intellectual reading and that's just more fun for you, no problem there. You're still taking in tons of new ideas that you're unfamiliar with. Of course, that's gonna be more creative and engaging as well. Number six, move. I mean, it's chemical move your bodies. It will just shake everything up in your brain. It's so healthy and it does definitely get creative juices flowing as well. And then if you want a two for one, go move outside because going outside takes us to a new setting. It's great for creativity. Number seven, explore. Go somewhere you haven't been before. And this could be a trip that you plan and schedule ahead of time, which is awesome. It could even be going on a walk in a different neighborhood than usual or going to a new restaurant. Anything where you can take in new sights and sounds and people and food. Exploring is really great. Number eight, look at art. Oh my gosh, look at art. I mean, it's creative for a reason, right? And most of us think of maybe going to an art museum, which yes, holy smokes, if you have access to a good museum or a gallery, yes, go, take an afternoon, wonderful. If you don't, or that's more time than you're looking for, um, maybe look at a book, like look at a picture book. Some of them are gorgeous. Get one of those big print books, maybe of an artist that you really love. We also live in a digital age, so maybe watch a really like good movie. You can look up a list of classic films and they're classics for a reason. They'll get you thinking, they'll get you taking in new ideas. You can look at foreign films and then you're exposed to like a new culture. Art films where it's like beautiful cinematography and that's an art piece in and of itself. There's even frankly something to be said for intentionally taking in particular social media. There are creative people out there putting content online 
all the time, constantly. And so if you have someone you really like or a couple people who are very inspiring to you and looking at their content just gets ideas going and really gives you energy, that counts too. The risk here and why you usually wouldn't mention social media is it falls so easily into being completely passive and just scrolling will just like relax the brain and put it to sleep and is not <laughs> inspiring. It uh, can have a negative effect. So you have to be really careful if you wanna go the social media route, but don't discredit it. There is something to be had there. Number nine, play a strategy game. Yes, because anytime you're playing a strategy game, you're constantly problem solving and there's no set answer, right? You get to come up with how you're gonna get out of the situation. So chess, checkers, cards, stratego. You can make a case for video games here and a careful case because it also easily falls into that completely passive way of just taking in media without really engaging or growing. But if it's a new game, you have a really good group of friends maybe, or it's something that you find very engaging, um, video games can count. Some of them are really beautiful and well-designed and absolutely like push your brain in new ways. Number 10, clean. So many of us, if our space is not organized well, it will make us stressed and stress uh, prevents like all brain function and especially creative brain function because we need to be kind of relaxed to give room for our brains to play. So sometimes cleaning is what it will take to like open up that brain space. And the act of cleaning itself can be a great opportunity for daydreaming and giving us time to kind of wander and play as we do these simple tasks that need to be done. It's also possible that our space is too clean, that it's like very strict and narrow and we feel like we can't relax, right? Again, if we think of creativity as like a little bit of play, we need to feel like we're in a space where we can relax, where we can take a breath, where we can maybe bring in some paints and not have a heart attack, right? You need to feel like it's a space you can engage with a little bit. So maybe assess that either way, if your space needs order and cleaning, or if it needs to relax a little bit and give you more space to breathe. Number 11, learn a new language. This is especially great if you love living in the left side of your brain and being really clean cut and analytical. Learning a new language is great because there's kind of a predictable guide of how to do it, but it's exposing you to a whole new set of rules and a new culture, and it really does get both sides of the brain totally working. Number 12, play with kids. If you have kids in your life, if you have children, if you have nieces and nephews, or you maybe babysit, if you're exposed to kids regularly and you have the chance to play with them, that is something to take advantage of. I think most of us as adults prefer to step back. Um, understandably, because <laughs> children's rules, like they don't live in the same world we do. They don't have the same rules as we do. And I think for most of us, we're afraid that we won't fit in with the kids, right? Or that we'll offend them somehow. But if you can, if you can, if you can step in and engage with them, I promise it will get creative and imaginative. Kids are, experts at play and imagination and we can learn a lot by spending time with them it's it's really fun so those are my 12 ideas that you can apply to be more creative in your daily life i hope at least a couple of them resonate with you and you feel like you can apply those those three overarching principles that we can apply generally to our lives which is to stay curious to develop a sense of play, give ourselves time and permission to play, and to step back a little bit from our usual self-criticism. Again, creativity is defined as the ability to generate original ideas that have value, but the creative process involves coming up with myriads of ideas, most of which will be terrible. And if we don't give ourselves permission to throw out a ton of weird, bad ideas, we'll never find the good ones. So I hope this video has been helpful and that you all have a great time finding a little more play and creativity in your daily lives. If you enjoyed this video, please do subscribe and I will see you next time.